Now, Europe experienced its warmest year on record last year. That's according to the European State of the Climate Report, published by the UN. At the same time, the continent was hit by its most extensive flooding in more than 10 years. Almost a third of Europe's rivers swelled to bursting point. The growing dangers from rising floodwaters are forcing local officials and scientists to devise new ways to protect areas. They include southern Spain, where the damage caused by last October's floods is still being felt. In Catarroja, just outside Valencia, Joaquin Raga is back in his metal workshop. Months after, it was swallowed by flood water. Some people don't even have a kitchen. The government is laying out plans to stop floods like this from tearing through homes and businesses again. Most important are the new projects we're developing that could protect the people. These are mini artificial wetlands that will act like sponges. Last October, Storm Dana unleashed a month's worth of rain in just a matter of hours, turning roads into rivers and towns into islands. While Valencia produces 180,000 tons of waste annually, we had to remove 1 million tons just from the disaster zone. The regional government set up emergency sorting centers. Teams separated soil, plastics and metals. But some threats are harder to see. Chemical residues and pharmaceuticals spread across wetlands. The region's natural ecosystems were not able to absorb the volumes of runoff. That's why officials are now proposing man-made wetlands, a lesson learned to help nature cope in the event of more flooding. Biologist Javi Jimenez lives near the Albufera Lagoon, a fragile wetland that was already in decline before the storm. When the flood hit, it made things even worse. Cleanup continues, much of it led by citizens. But Jimenez says the pace and the scale aren't enough. What volunteers are doing is vital. Cleaning up waste is important, but completely insufficient. Valencia's plan includes parks that absorb water like a sponge, turning flood control into a public space. But while the plans are ambitious, the question is whether they will come fast enough or big enough to meet the next storm. Because another Dana storm will come, and it could be worse. Scientists say human-driven global warming is intensifying extreme weather. I'm concerned for my son. He'll have to deal with extreme weather in the future. Joaquin's workshop is running again. But what worries him most isn't the last flood. It's the next one. And joining me for more is Samantha Burgess. She's deputy director at Copernicus Climate Change Service that released that report we've been talking about. So, Samantha, 2024 broke the record for the hottest year worldwide. On average, it was the hottest ever recorded in Europe. And we saw the worst flooding in Europe in more than a decade. What does all this tell you? The Europe is the fastest warming continent with temperatures rising at about twice the global average rate. The last three years were the warmest years Europe has ever recorded. And we are likely to continue to see extreme events and the hazards from extreme events continue. Uh, and they will vary across Europe from wildfires, droughts and heat waves to extreme flooding like we just saw in the report from Spain. Now, there's growing concern that the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is slipping out of reach. Is That's considered a tipping point, as it were. Is climate change still reversible, in your opinion? Yes. So the reality is every single fraction of a degree matters. So it's true that we may exceed the 1.5 degree target. Um, but the, the sooner we get to net zero and the sooner we stabilise our climate, the, the easier it will be to stop some of those tipping points from happening in the future that are more likely to happen once we exceed two degrees above that pre-industrial level. 
Now, your report points out that half of European cities now have plans in place to better adapt to climate change. Do you regard that as significant progress? Yeah, it, it doesn't sound like it, given that we still have 49% of cities to, to go. But uh, Europe has been, made six, significant pro progress to become more resilient. And uh, only five years ago, Europe was at 26% of cities. So that's a really great step forward. In addition to the city adaptation plans that we covered in the report, we saw uh, more energy from renewable sources uh, powering Europe than ever before last year. You're talking about extreme heat scenarios and, and extreme weather events. Lots of flooding could be coming our way still. Give us a sense of what's actually being done in Europe to adapt to climate change. What measures do you think are most effective? It, it really depends on where you are and the hazards that are going to impact you locally. So we know from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that uh, Europe is likely to get stronger storms, wetter storms, because in a warmer atmosphere, uh, more rain falls and it falls more heavily. Uh, we also know from the IPCC that we're likely to get more heat waves that will be stronger and last longer. <clears throat> These heat waves also lead to wildfire conditions and, and droughts. So it depends where you are in Europe as to what adaptation measures are useful. We increasingly live in urbanized environments, so it's really important to ensure we have green spaces and, and natural environments within the urban center to try and cool those cities down, make sure we've got um, biodiversity hotspots that can act as sponges to absorb the, the heavy rain to make sure we can mitigate Against, mitigate against the worst impacts of flooding and heat stress. Now, in times of economic crisis, and we're in those times, uh, governments may be reluctant to invest in preventing climate change and stopping climate change. How do you go about convincing them to follow your advice? Uh, so it's not just about climate change. And, and for me, this is uh, the most important point that when we adapt and ensure that we're climate resilient, we have a huge number of co-benefits. So when we green our cities, not only are we cooling our cities down, but we know providing more green spaces leads to better air quality, leads to better health and well-being. So there's a huge number of co-benefits that come alongside climate adaptation. So it's really important to bear that in mind that there is a cost of transitioning but there are huge benefits for society, for our infrastructure of society as well, and, and for ecosystem resilience. Samantha, thank you very much for your insights. That was Samantha Burgess from the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Thank you so much.